Okay. Welcome to seminar number two, Understanding Cognitive Demands uh, and the Dryden Air Ontario Crash in March 1989. Um, the thing we should begin with first is questions that people have from the previous session. Are there things that you want to talk about or concerns that you have or issues that have come up, things that you're now thinking about or things that you want to bring up for attention or discussion? Okay, that's very reassuring. <laughs> um, so, um, you've had a chance at least to look at some of the materials here and get a handle on the range of things, and the range of things in this collection of work is quite large. It extends all the way from, from uh, very theoretical bits of stuff that look really complicated to very concrete things like checklists to um, uh, as far north as um, uh, Winnipeg on uh, uh, Manitoba and as far south as the Micronesian Islands. And so it's a kind of a global experience. And the goal of this seminar is to put this all together in a way that makes some sense for you and that gets you a step closer to thinking about cognitive tasks and the cognitive uh, domain that we're trying to enter. Um, so let's first begin with um, the look at, at uh, uh, Woods and the paper from 1987. Um, Mapping Cognitive Demands in a Complex Problem-Solving World. And this is a, uh, an important paper, perhaps not a landmark paper. It's, it's been, um, it's been uh, I think, not as widely used, perhaps, as the uh, uh, sorry. Not as widely used as um, the cognitive systems engineering paper, new wine and new models, but it's from the same vintage, and uh, uh, it's actually quite good for us because, in a way, it captures the sort of state of things in 1987. Since 1987, things have changed. People have gotten more um, sophisticated, and, and things have moved around, but. The, the first thing that you would notice is when you're looking at this paper is that they're still thinking about nuclear power plants and they're still trying to figure out how to handle nuclear power plant accidents. The examples that they take, the language that they use, is a language basically of uh, control rooms. the human operators who are getting this information from the control room setting, but you can't see the power plant directly because it's not visible to them, who are trying to make all their, and who are then engaged in this complex process of trying to figure out uh, what's wrong. Things that I, what are the knobs or levers that I can grab and twist and pull to make something happen, and and a lot of stuff about what are the pluses and minuses of doing. guys are, the, the basic model of what's happening here is that the, the plant 
people are engaged in some sort of, of process control and that there's this complex uh, uh, and dangerous thing out here. But that it's, that it's really quite separate from them. And there's this control room set of displays and indicators and knobs and dials and all that sort of stuff. That it's what they see that from about that indicates the plant. And from this, they we got to the idea last time that in order to answer these questions, what these guys really do is they develop some sort of mental model. of what's happening and in their mental model they understand that there's some sort of problem and from the mental model that they're sort of running in their heads like a little simulator that's going on in their head they are, are able to conclude from this that um, we should be able to see on the displays a particular pattern that looks looks something like this. That is, they have, in order to be able to answer this question, what they're trying to do in their heads is actually to run some sort of mental model of the plant and to develop in this model a kind of flaw or think about a particular kind of flaw and say that if that flaw were present, then I would see this particular pattern of instruments, these controls would be reading this, this control would be reading that, and I would see that there, and they're looking at this to try and think about what the diagnostic problem is. Okay, it's very much the same problem that you have if um, your spouse calls you up and tells you that the car won't start. You're not there, you can't do it, do anything with it, you can't tell what's going on, but your spouse says the car won't start, and you say, well, uh, you know, what happens when you turn the key? And they will say, nothing happens. And you think, well, okay, this is the battery, and so on and so forth, because you have a mental model of how that car works. And you're able to run that mental model and, and look at the different kinds of places at which you could have different kinds of faults. And with the different kinds of displays that you might have, you can see different kinds of patterns in these instruments. That will tell you what's going on. And each one of these will be, be the, you know, in sort of the simple, simplistic theory, each one of the different faults will be manifested by some different set of display to display features and you'll be able to figure it out, right? You can, depending upon which one of these things is broken, we'll have these different sorts of things going on here. And that's the basic idea that we got from that. And people are trying to figure out ways to, what, what Woods and other people are doing is in, set, in some sense trying to hold back the tide. Because what's happening in the wake of Three Mile Island is everyone and his uncle who thinks they have anything to do, any Everyone who believes that they have any insight at all into human psychology or operators or plants or instruments or others is proposing solutions to keep Three Mile Island from happening again. So you've got, you've got just yards of pieces of paper, stacks of paper coming in to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and all the plant manufacturers and all the concerned interest groups of, of solutions, essentially solutions to... TMI. And they're all based upon this model of what happened at TMI. They all, they all have a model of what happened and they all have an idea about how to design the control room they're all, they're all looking at ways to change the control room around in some way so that later on these guys don't get caught in the same problem. It's a very straightforward idea. They are not, by the way, thinking very much about changing the plant. They're thinking about changing the control room. And the reason is the plant, which costs several billion dollars, has already been built. 
So all we can do now is slap on other things to try and fix this. So it, it, they really see it as being a problem of getting the controls right so that the operators can figure this out and not make mistakes. And, and what Woods is saying in this paper, in both the, and Woods and Holmagel, and you see that in one case it's Woods and Holmagel, and in the other case it's Holmagel and Woods, and this is because they sort of flipped a coin to decide who was going to be the number one and number two persons on these papers, and you'll see them doing this throughout their, throughout their careers, trying to do this, so it, it, there's no, no one knows who is the real source of the ideas here, it's just they keep changing the order of authors. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, look, there's got to be some sort of orderly way of going about this because, in fact, there are just way too many solutions out here that, and, and, and the solutions are not good in, in large part because the particular problem of TMI, that particular sequence that they had, is not likely to be the thing that happens the next time. And the people who are proposing all these solutions are basically people who say, ah, if we add another alarm out here, if we add another measure over there, if we add another thing over here, then we will have solved the problem. And what these guys are saying is, no, no, wait, you've got to rethink this all. You've got to think more about what is going on with the operator, not just building a set of displays that cover all the different possible ways that the plant can be broken, but rather ask yourself some questions about how is it that operators are doing these sorts of things and what are they doing? They're all process control questions. That is, they're all imagine that the world is sort of running smoothly. The plant is running, zzz, generating like this, zzz, and then something happens, click. You know, a turbine trips, the reactor trips, a pipe breaks, but something happens, and then the process world goes, zzz, and they then get have to start figuring things out. Very much the model of what happened at TMI, right? The world's working, everything's sort of okay, and then something happens, and now we have to figure out what's wrong. This is the problem that everyone is trying to deal with. Very few people at this time are saying, hey, wait, maybe this is not something that we ought to be building. Maybe this is too complicated. Maybe this is something that nobody's going to ever be able to figure out. Maybe it's got too many flaws and faults in it. And, and TMI, which is uh, 1979, is followed in 1985 by the Davis-Bessey event which is the one that they analyze in the paper. And Davis Bessie in, in, uh, in, in is, a, is another plant, very similar to this plant, its sister. And what happens at Davis Bessie is another version of TMI. They have the same accident again. They have a trip. They have the loss of coolant flow in the, in the secondary side. They have issues about the reactor uh, having too much heat in it, they open up the PORV and start stumping chemo. I mean, just all the stuff that happened at TMI happens again six years later. And everybody goes, holy cow, this is TMI again. Um, one of the problems with what happens at Davis-Bessey is that knowing that it's TMI again doesn't allow them to solve the problem. And there's a variety of reasons. It's a long, complex story that you can read about. The, the, the important thing is that although it's a kind of second TMI or TMI number two, it's different enough that the kinds of things that the operators are trying to do are different. In fact, they spend time trying to do things that are not in the list of appropriate things to do when you're in TMI that came out of TMI. Right? That the TMI, there was a lot of paper that came out and said, if this ever happens again, I want you to push this button. But when that happened again, they didn't immediately push the button. They did some other things. And everybody was very concerned about that. People were really upset. You, we told you to push the button. Why didn't you push the button? The answer was complicated, but it had a lot to do with the fact that pushing the button would have had some undesired consequences. And they thought they could fix the problem. And they went out and fixed the problem in a short enough period of time that they were able to, keep, to restore the plant operation without pushing the button. And everybody was really, really upset about this. Now it was clear that the operators were not going to follow directions under any conditions. I mean, you just couldn't make the rules strong enough to get everybody to do this. And the reason was because they're actually thinking about what's going on, what's wrong, what is it doing now, what is available for me to do, and uh, what are the different consequences of doing these different things. Because none of them are consequence-free. They all have 
All of them have side effects and bad effects and other issues that are associated with them. Um, into that world step Woods and Holnagel, and they say, no, look, it's this idea about trying to fashion solutions for the accident that happened in the past is the wrong idea. Because the accident that happens in the future is going to be different again than, than this, either TMI or DHS, it's not going to repeat exactly the same way. And, and we're not clever enough to think of all the different ways that the system can fail. We've demonstrated that with TMI and Davis Bessie and some other plants. So what we really need to do is we really need to, to work on this business about how people are able to figure out models and figure out what's going on and how they test those sorts of things, how they answer these sorts of questions. And this is why they are interested in mapping the cognitive demands of complex problem-solving worlds. This is a complex problem-solving world. The process was going along fine, bang, it broke, and now they're trying to fix it. They're trying to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. And that's a set of cognitive demands that are facing the operator. The operator is, is asked to do things to figure out the answers to these sorts of questions using the data that they can get from this control room set of displays. And what Woods and Holnagel are saying is, you're spending too much time talking about the little details of each one of these different displays and not thinking enough about the bigger problem, which is that people have to be able to figure out what the plant's doing. And they have to figure out what the consequences of taking different actions are. In particular, they're really concerned about this. Because this issue about what happens if I do this, what happens if I turn this on or turn this off, is the key idea here, right? The purpose of these people is to keep the plant from melting down, but also to keep it from being destroyed or damaged. And they're trying to do that by looking at a whole bunch of different options. And the question is, how, can they, how do they make these decisions and how do they select different kinds of choices? And what Woods and Holnagel, or Holnagel and Woods, are saying is somehow you have to be able to add, look at what the real demands are associated with answering these problems and assist people in solving those problems rather than insisting upon knowing, upon, upon pretending that you know what to do. You gotta stop saying the designers of these control rooms and other you gotta stop saying you are the expert and you just want the operators to follow the directions. You have to start taking them seriously and say what are the demands that these guys are facing, not in not in, in sort of control room terms, but in these larger terms. And what they want to do is they, they actually ask us in here <coughs> to recognize that that we don't actually have a good language for this. That is this stuff here, how, how this is expressed, how do we say this, what they are doing, what is going on? We don't actually have a language at that time. In 1987, there's no language to describe this stuff that they are doing. They don't, we've, 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 we've reduced everything to concrete stuff. Turn this switch, close that valve, check this, if it's above that, do the sets of instructions. But nothing to talk about this bigger stuff. And in particular, now after Three Mile Island, we all recognize that there's so much stuff out here, there's so much data, that in fact, just managing the data itself is one of the cognitive tasks. That is, not only do you have to figure it out, you have to look at this world that's filled with signals and data and try and decide what's meaningful in that. Because some of the signals that you're getting are signals about the way the plant is failing, and some of the signals you're getting are consequences of this failure, but they're, they're secondary consequences, and some of them are wrong data. Some of this stuff is not really known. Some of it's going to be, you remember the PORV example, the light is on, but the valve isn't closed. So some of the data is actually false, it's incorrect. They have to live in a world where data is not pure. And so there's uncertainty that's associated with this, and they want to know how people are going to manage these kinds of uncertainties. And so what they're trying to get us to do is to think about ways in which we might, instead of talking about what people ought to do, ask what it is that people are actually going to do. And, and they tell us explicitly on page 258, they say, to build a cognitive description of a complex world, 
The first hurdle is to escape from the language of the application. And what they really have done is they've said, look, it's really hard to know what's going on inside people's heads. We can't look inside your head. Even if we were to take your head and, and cut your, you know, your, your skull off like this and lift it off and look inside, we still wouldn't see what you're thinking. And so it's really hard to get in here. And, and it's really hard to answer these questions in any kind of meaningful way. But what we should be doing is we should be looking at at what are the real demands that are flowing in this system. Not, not how do people solve the problems or what are they using to solve the problems, but what problems are they required to solve? What is the demand that they are facing? What is the requirements for them? They're looking mostly sort of from the system side towards the operator. That is, the, they're saying that the system is presenting problems for the operator to solve. They're not talking about how operators solve problems in this paper. They're talking about how do we characterize what the system is requiring of people. This is, again, still very much focused on this control room view of the world. There's a fixed set of data. There's only so much you can see. You're looking at everything. And this world out here is a nice, static world. Nobody's doing construction on the power plant this time. Nobody's building a new power plant. It's a power plant that's been built that you understand. So your mental models are pretty well fixed for this. And so all we have to do is just tell you, figure out a way to explain what the real demands are, and then we'll get to this part about figuring out what you ought to actually do. Um, the important thing about this is that they immediately recognize that this is really hard to do. I mean, they, they recognize that, that in the end, although they, these demands are coming from the world, they're perceived by the operator. And so it's really the operator's ability to formulate these sorts of questions and understand what's going on in terms of these questions that matters. And so they are, they're stuck, once again, with having to go and look into the operator and see what's going on. And they, they, they admit that this is a really hard thing to do. But they give you a list of suggestions on page 259. Uh, they say, um, it's a big domain, it's hard to figure out, there's lots of stuff that's complicated here. And then in the second to last paragraph they say, um, as the analysis progresses, it helps the cognitive technologist to interpret answers to questions or observations and decide where to direct further investigations of the domain. They say, and then they give you the list of things to do here. They say that the, the, it doesn't matter how you do this. The approach is indifferent to the approach is indifferent to the particular sources of a domain information, which means basically we don't care where you find out what's going on. There's no, there's no best source of information. There's no perfect operator. There's no you know, God's eye view of this. doesn't matter. You can ask anybody you want. You can uh, find a right specialist to talk to, look at the right documents or analyses, Look empirically at how a problem is solved by setting one up in the simulator or watching people do this. Or, or putting the problem solver in a simulation setting. Uh, interviewing people who perform the task. People whose specialties intersect with the task. This is a pretty big list. okay? And it's not very well formed. It's sort of saying, like, go out and talk to people. Figure out what's going on. It doesn't give you a lot of time. It's not, it's not the kind of... of stuff that we would think of as extremely valuable. They're saying, look, you have to figure this out, and somehow you have to go out there and do some field studies or do some talking to people or ask somebody what the heck is going on when people are trying to solve these problems. <coughs> and in fact, one of the remarkable things about the rest of the paper is that it doesn't really give you very much stuff about how that should actually be done. It, it then sort of slips on into the goal means analysis and what that means. And that's about the, the level of help that you're going to get from these guys. They aren't going to help you much more than that. Now, in part, they're not going to help you much more than that because the system that they're actually looking at is a pretty fixed system. Control rooms don't change very rapidly. The instruments, you go in on Tuesday, the instruments are in exactly the same place they were on Monday. Okay. The plant, the, the thermodynamics, the way energy is transferred, all the rest of that stuff on Wednesday is going to be the same as it was the previous Sunday. 
There's very little change in this world. So figuring this stuff out is, is going to be relatively easy. It, although they talk about a dynamic world and dynamic dynamism being a problem, from an analytical standpoint, the world is pretty fixed. It's pretty nice. I mean, it's not like geologic. It's not like mountains and stuff. But, but you know, a nuclear power plant, once it's there, it's pretty well there. And the piping doesn't get changed overnight into some different set of connections. So they kind of wave their hands a little bit about how, how ought you to do this and jump right into this next business, which is the gold means analysis. And the idea of the gold means analysis Oh, anybody need a picture before that goes down? No, okay. Um, the idea of the gold means analysis is, a, is sort of a classic Western approach to figuring out how systems work. It's a gold decomposition. And it says, basically, that there's a, <coughs> there's a main goal out here. And that every goal has some means to accomplish that goal. And we're going to figure out what the goal is, and we're going to figure out what the means are. This is what they're, they're saying. It's very simple. This is what we're trying to achieve. That might be something like um, we want the plant to, we want the, the core should stay covered with water, okay? That's a goal, right? And that's a very concrete, everybody understands this. When you uncover the core, bad things happen. We're going to make sure the core is covered with water. That's a goal. It's irrespective of the other things in the power plant. That's a goal. It's a very high level goal, right? If you ask, will, will people be willing to let the goal be uncovered if it's uh, party night and everybody wants to go home early? The answer is no. Okay, it's a really high level goal. And so we've got goal one out here, which is keep the core covered. And, and then the, they'll ask, well, what do you need to do that? And so then there'll be some means for accomplishing that goal. And those means will be a, a, a variety of different things, but what you'll get in here are things like um, uh, inflows of water, Uh, in a different variety of ways, ways to get water in there to keep the, the thing covered. And um, some other things like uh, closing um, valves that are letting water out. I mean, it's kind of concrete stuff, right? And, and you can make a list of these. You can get up, you can, you can actually go through and say, there's, there's, this, there's some different means. Now, the problem is that these means themselves are not things you can accomplish. You can't say, I want an inflow of water and just sort of have it appear. You can't, it's not, you know, you're not God. And so you can't say, give me water and have it disappear. You have to get your inflow of water from someplace, which means that there has to be, down below this, some other set of means for which this thing is actually a goal. But now we begin to do the system decomposition process, and what we're really doing is we're saying what looks like a means to a very high-level goal is actually another goal to another lower level of, of things, which might be um, the emergency core cooling system. Okay. We have an emergency core cooling system. It creates an inflow of water into the reactor. If we turn that on, we're going to get an inflow of water. Therefore, this is a means to accomplish this goal. So this level is this level here is interesting because this becomes viewed from the top, it's a means. And viewed from the bottom, it's a goal. Okay? It's just a question of which one of the perspectives you take. And even down here, you'll be able to, to work out, oh, gee, the emergency core, core cooling system is, is made, made out of a variety of different things. It's got a whole bunch of different pipes and pumps and motors and stuff. 
and, and somehow those things have to be turned on and operated. So there's some other things that have to happen down here that are, are further means to, the, to this, which treat this as a goal. And you can keep doing this. And if you do it long enough, what you're going to end up with down here is somewhere you're going to have something that looks like physical water faucet and you're going to point at this and you're going to say <clears throat> if you turn this water will come out that's what I'm talking about it's that that faucet right there that valve that thing that mechanical object which I go to and I do this on and that is the the means by which I accomplish the goals up above it right this is the goal means hierarchy it's the core idea of all uh, analysis of these big systems. It's not very much different than a standard idea of decomposition that you get in most analytic processes in Western thought. I mean, every Western kind of notion about the analysis of systems involves looking at subsystems and other subsystems. But here, what's significant about it is that it's described in terms of goals. And the means are to a particular goal. And, and this, is, this is different because it is fundamentally, what we, the word is teleological, which is a philosophical way of saying has a purpose. That is, we don't have these goals and means because they are inherent in the technology. We have these goals and means because we have a purpose for doing what we are doing. And this high level goal to essentially keep the reactor safe requires us to keep that thing covered with water and all the rest of the things that flow from this are for that purpose. It's all purposeful. It's all done for a purpose. It's not done, we're not tracing out the logical connections between things in the sense that we are tracing out the relationship between DNA and RNA and proteins and other things like that. We're not, we're not saying this is the relationship. What we're saying is this is the series of purposes for which we have built the system and the way it is running. And in, in this analysis, we can do this as far as we want until we finally kind of ground out down here in concrete stuff. And Rasmussen, would, would, what Rasmussen does later, and you'll see this in his, his uh, 1986 work, uh, and since then, is he points out that this kind of thing extends quite a ways up because the goal of having a power plant is on the one hand to provide electricity to the society um, and the pro goal of electricity to the society is to allow people to be functional and live a good life and so on and so forth. And Rasmussen says, look, you know, we're mostly concerned about starting out here and working our way down. That's the Woods view. Rasmussen turns this around and goes way up the top. He says, wait a minute, we've got to really think about all of these things. Because it turns out that a map of these shows that there are goals that are in conflict. And so you can have a situation where you have a goal. Uh, let's take this goal as one. Um, Not, not save, save the reactor so that it doesn't get covered, it doesn't create a, a nuclear meltdown and all the problems, but we, it's a very expensive piece of machinery. It's a, it's a, it cost a lot of money. And we bought this thing and we paid for it, and now we need to keep using it to get the payoff. Right? So we, it's a valuable thing. We don't want to throw this away. You have to treat this with care. And it turns out that saving the reactor for years means that there are certain things that you ought probably not to do. And what, what, of course, will happen is that at some point, there will be some place where there will be a conflict back and forth between two goals, where one goal, the accomplishment of one goal, obstructs another or, or gets in the way of another. 
or where the accomplishment of one goal depends upon another. There are two kinds of relationships. If you have one which is sort of an obstruction, if I do this, then I foreclose the possibility of doing that. And another one which is, in order to do this, I need to actually do these other things as well, because some of these things, you, you can have multiple entries into this, right? There can be multiple means to achieving goals. In fact, probably all goals have multiple means. And so you begin to build this map, and what you've got is lots and lots of boxes with, that are goals and means at the same time. And, and the, way that you, the way that you solve a conflict between two goals is you look up. If it looks like two goals are, are, this, are in conflict with each other, you, to figure out what to do, you look up the reactor. So, so up, the, up the, the list. So saving the reactor for use is a good goal, but it's not as good a goal as preventing the reactor from melting down. I'd rather have a reactor that's not usable but hasn't melted down yet than have a reactor that is melted down and then becomes unusable. So I can sacrifice this goal if I need to do, if I need to keep this going because it connects to the higher sets of goals. The way operators are, are thinking about this thing, and remember this is the, we're trying to look at what the domain is requiring, the way operators will think about this is going to depend upon how well they can understand what the goals and relationships are. That is, if you're talking about what the mental model is for the operator, it's got to include this kind of map if they're to get it right. If you don't have this map, if the operator just has a map of, uh, suppose the operator just has a map of the core and how it works, that doesn't tell him what to do. It doesn't answer the question, what are the consequences of doing these different things? It doesn't tell him how to act or how to act. And so the whole point is that if you want the operators to be able to know what to do, they have to understand what this goal mean structure is, at least enough in a way that they end up sacrificing some goals to achieve others in the right way. Obviously, if you end up with the operator who you confront with the question, is it more important to keep the reactor covered with water than it is to go and have dinner? And he says it's more important to go and have dinner. You have a serious problem. <laughs> Everybody understands that. But the, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that the TMI and Davis Bessie and the virtually all the other reactors uh, situations that we see, nobody has accused the operators of doing that. They're all, busy. they're all really trying to make things work. Nobody's misunderstanding that this is not a very important thing. <coughs> you might ask the question, well, how do, how do we map all this? How do we practically do this? And, and it's, it turns out, of course, to be actually fairly difficult to get a good map. Um, and what, what, what you will see is that in most cases, the maps that people produce are the maps that they imagine that operators ought to have. And they are usually consist of a few things, but nobody ever gets a sort of complete map of the whole reactor system. It's too complicated, it's too big, it's too hard to do. So if you take any one particular problem, you say, how do we deal with this problem over here? If you make a, a focus on that, And you really look at it, you can say, oh yes, I see in here that there are these goals and they're in conflict here and there's a higher level goal. And I understand that these are the various kinds of means that are possible here and how they relate to these different things. You can, on demand, you can work this out in a particular area. You can go into an area and you can say, I see, when I focus down, when I take my, uh, my magnifying glass and I focus right at this area, I can see that this is where, what's going on. But nobody actually builds the whole model. All right? And the reason is because after a couple of steps in here, it becomes unmanageable. I mean, it's just too complicated to actually make one of these things. You can, you can try, but you end up with reams of paper that nobody really understands. You know, you end up with this kind of thing that looks like a big computer flowchart, and you just, you don't really know what it actually means. 
But the fact is that in problem situations, if you look at particular difficult problems that people are confronted with, that is, in, if you say, um, well, I know that you have a TMI-like thing, and I know you have a David Bessie-type thing, and a variety of others, if you look at these as examples of different kinds of faults, you can build these things pretty well, and you can actually get them, you can do them so well that you can build models of them in a computer and have the computer solve the problems of how to deal with this. It's called a cognitive simulation. And one of the things that Woods does a year or two down the road here is build computer simulations of how people solve these kinds of problems and demonstrate that he gets the same solutions that the operators actually have. Okay. Now, there's two kinds of, of ways that he, he proposes to sort of fill this out for people. I'm not going to try and fill it out, but, but he proposes two ways of looking at this. One is, one is he proposes this idea of evidence utilization. And basically what this is, is looking at the way operators use data from the world. You make a, you, you let things happen, you watch them in simulators, you watch them during the day, but you watch them and you wait and you see how the operator how the operator looks into the world to use the evidence there. What is it that they're looking at? What are the things on the control panel that they use? What kinds of data are they looking at? And, and by doing this you can, you can begin to get a handle on, on their idea, particularly about some of the constraints on what it is that they can do, some ideas about what's actually going on uh, uh, as they search for data in the world. You watch them search for data in the world, and that'll give you a clue as to what it is that they're trying to figure out in here. The, the idea of this is, uh, is partly uh, driven by that need to find solutions to the problem because much of what people are doing in control room design is trying to fix the way evidence is displayed so that the evidence utilization becomes better. If you notice one of the critiques of the, of the uh, checklists was that some checklists require you to, to look at the checklist and then look in one part of the control space and then look at the checklist and look in another part of the control space. And you sometimes have to be bouncing all over and there's no coherence to it. Well, that's certainly true about how people had to use utilize evidence in the power plants. And so there was this idea, gee, maybe we should put the evidence together so you don't have to look over all these different places. Stuff like that. And these are quite logical ways of dealing with things. And, and the, what, what Woods is telling you, and Woods and Holding are telling you, is, gee, we ought, to, we ought to try and look at how operators really try and use evidence and then make it easier for them to do that sort of thing. Um, they also point out that this is actually quite difficult to do uh, for a variety of reasons, but um, that's one of the methods. The other method that they use is, is what, uh, and I just love this because it, it's so obvious, is what they call pragmatic reasoning. And, and what, what they're really doing is they're saying look for situations in which people are trying to make, re to reason about the way that things are working. Look at the kinds of reasoning that they're doing when they are trying to consider how to do the different things. Um, and, and he's looking at, at the, not just the way that they are reasoning about faucets and things like that, but the way that they are reasoning about these higher goals. It's really an interesting kind of question. What is pragmatic reasoning? Is there any other kind? Is there non-pragmatic reasoning, for example? I don't think so. I don't think there's, I think pragmatic is supposed to mean that it's somehow connected to the world in some meaningful way. Mm. I don't really know very much about pragmatic reasoning, and I'm not sure that anybody else really does either. But the idea is, is in a way, if you think about this, the pragmatic reasoning and the evidence utilization are both ways of looking into the operator and what they are doing.
for clues about what the demands are in the outside world. That is, at the end of this, although they've really said, we're mapping the demands, the cognitive demands of the domain, all right? They're trying to tell you about the requirements outside of the operator. In the end, they end up going into the operators to try and figure out what's actually happening. That is, they say, the, after all the theory and all the talk, what they give you is this series of things, which is go talk to the operators, look at the documents, try and figure out what's important here, ask anybody you can, and by the way, look at how the operators are trying to solve the problem, and try and figure out what it is that they're reasoning about this. And I, I don't mean to make light of this. This is actually a fairly good idea, but, but if you get past all the sort of elaborate technical language, this is what they're proposing that we do, right? And, and indeed, um, they get into these kinds of elaborate sorts of things like, does, problem, does the problem solver know that a requirement relation exists and is now relevant between units A and B, or a post-condition goal process alternative inter-goal constraint or other relationship? If for other reasons A needs to be done, then B must first be satisfied, therefore check if B is satisfied, and so on. I mean, yeah, we can understand that someone could possibly think about the world in that way, and yeah, maybe you could even build some models that way, but are we really going to be able to sort of dissect the world down to this point where we can make this complete map and model and answer all these questions? And the answer is, I think, probably not. And that's one of the reasons why I think that this is not, this is not taken off in quite the way that it was expected, because in fact, although all of these ideas are quite reasonable, and all of our thinking about them says, oh yes, I can see how you could do that in a sort of logical way. In practice, it turns out to be really, really hard to do. In theory, it looks great. The University of Chicago, we used to have a saying, it's fine in practice, but the, how does it work in theory? And, and, and in fact, this is one of the problems here, is it's, it's fine in theory, but it doesn't, it's not easy to see how it works in practice. But what Woods does give us an observation in here, more of an empirical observation, that really changes things, and I think changes the world a little bit. And, and it's on page 270 uh, in the first full paragraph. And he starts to talk about some of the real problems that face people. And, and he says, look, he says, when a large number of interconnected parts is combined with another dimension of complexity, dynamism, that is, this thing changing very rapidly. The disturbance management cognitive situation arises. Now this is a really interesting idea. And what Woods is trying to get at here is, is this observation that operators can switch strategies. That is, they can go from answering, trying to answer these sorts of questions in other situations to say, is disturbance management, and this is a completely different kind of activity. And what we'll, they slip this in here in this little paragraph with almost, with almost without any kind of introduction, and they tell us about disturbance management here. And then go on and talk about it just a little bit, but it turns out that this is really crucial. Disturbance management is what you do when you don't know what to do. Okay? There's a wonderful paper uh, in problem solving literature called Problem Solving is What You Do When You Don't Know What To Do. Um, disturbance management is what you do when you don't know how to fix the underlying problem. But what you are trying to do is preserve the system long enough that you will have that chance. And anybody who works in the healthcare field knows exactly what disturbance management is. Disturbance management is when you start chest compression. 
When you, have start, when you are doing chest compressions, this is disturbance management. You've given up all the other diagnostic activities and you've said, my primary goal right now is to keep the, the little red things going round and round so that the, the, the big white thing up here continues to get enough uh, oxygen that people will survive. I mean, that's uh, all you're saying. You're not, you're not saying, I know what the problem is, I can fix this, da da da, that this was this. Disturbance management is where you shift in this big way a shift of activities that the people are doing from being in this, I'm trying to figure out what goes on, the diagnostic, what is happening here, how does this work, what's happening, to I am trying to keep the system from, from essentially crashing or dying or just uh, ending up in a disastrous way because. If I don't do this, it won't matter. I'm not going to get the result and fix it in time. Yes? Isn't that going up to a really high level? Yes. And what this is saying is that there are times when, remember, this, there's this question about whether or not we're talking about a model of what's in the world or a model of what's in the head of the operator. And we've kind of fudged that and said, are we talking about domain models? and mapping the complexities of the domain. It sounds like it's outside the operator and so forth. But the point is that it can get so nasty in here, especially when things are changing rapidly or there's lots of different components, that you can spend so much time trying to figure out what's happening in here that the system dies while you're doing that. And that one of the skills of operators is to essentially abandon those activities and change their operation, what, what it is that they are doing, to a completely different kind of activity, which is keep it alive, keep it going. Now, this is a this is a really profound kind of idea. I mean, it's much more it's it's much more profound than than it's given uh, credit in the paper. It's just it appears just as a kind of um, you know another paragraph here. But the point is that the world, even the world of the nuclear power plant, which is pretty fixed, pretty static, pretty engineered, we understand it pretty well, can get so confusing that what you have to do is stop trying to figure out what's going on and take steps that will simply preserve the plant. You don't know. You can't answer the question. You are doing things in a different way, which is, I'm trying to preserve this. And you're absolutely right. It, it is connected, but it may not be connected it, I should say it, it is connected the, as a high-level goal, but, but what's happened is that the situation is such that people are down here somewhere in these lower-level goals trying to figure out relationships and solve problems and do diagnosis and all the rest of this stuff. And during that time, the system's condition has gone from bad to worse. And now, in order to, to achieve these high-level goals, we have to stop doing that and do something quite different, even though the consequences of that may be very bad. No one likes to do chest compressions, right? It just everybody hates doing chest compressions. It's a sign of failure. I don't want to do it. You know, if we're doing chest compressions, it's a bad thing. But when there's no circulation, you should be doing chest compressions. And there's no other alternatives here. Unless there is one. It's if the guy has an implantable ventricular assist device. There's no point in doing chest compressions. It doesn't help. But uh, short of that you're going to bounce out of whatever you're doing and go up and start managing the disturbance. And interestingly enough, we also observe now that one of the things that differs between really, really skilled and not so skilled operators is the really, really skilled operators seem to move to disturbance management at just the right point. That is, the person who starts doing the chest compressions at the right moment is a real expert. If you delay too long, you're a novice. And if you start too early, you're a novice. It's getting the timing right. But the point here is that, that, that what Woods is setting up for us is a kind of model about how to look at systems and how to try and evaluate them that I think is actually much more revealing than the paper seems to make it, which is that although we're talking about the world and modeling characteristics of the world, we in fact find ourselves so overwhelmed with the complexity of that as analysts that we end up going back and looking at operators and trying to figure out what it is that they are doing. The way you understand the dynamics of these, these complicated worlds it's not by starting from first principles and saying, well, the reactor core should be remain covered. The way you do this is go out and study what operators do, because they're the ones who are actually confronting this all the time. You need to be able to actually look at those people, and they admit that. That's something that you have to do here. You have to go and talk to these people and ask them what's going on. You can do some of this modeling stuff that they talk about, and, and 
you could actually talk, to, uh, I think, a lot about what the actual cognitive demands of the people are. But once you realize that there's this, you realize that not only are people doing this sort of thing, but they're, they're, they're supposed to keep doing it and reassessing it and updating it and becoming more aware of it all the time. That it's not like I have an event and then I do this diagnostic process and at the end of that I fix the problem. It's rather I have an event, I start a diagnostic process, and then I also have to start handling the consequences of the event and start doing things and also keep track of stuff so that if something new comes along, I can recognize that and begin to step in and prepare. And you're all operators, so you will all recognize that this is in fact what people really do. Okay. So the, 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 this idea here about how we get into this system and, and begin to model it, Woodson, Holnagel, Holnagel and Woods, are proposing a very particular set of things. It sounds very good. We all buy it in theory. None of us know how to do it in practice, except for very specific cases. We can go in and look in a particular area, and yeah, we can map some of this stuff out. But how do we know which area to look at? Well, we have to look at what the operators are using for evidence in the world and figure out what that means. And, and somehow we're supposed to get at what their pragmatic reasoning is. In a way, it's, it's, it's almost as if they've finessed the problem and given it back to us in another form. We started out trying to figure out how operators reason about the system and what they're doing and all the rest of this stuff. And in the end, we get told that we should do some understanding about what the, how operators reason and what's going on in the system. When I read this, uh, it made me, I, I thought it was quite heavy reading, but <coughs> in a way of, it made me, it reminded me of an analogy from, I think, Herbert Simon with the ant on the beach. And what they're saying is try to find a way to model the beach and to find, and about the motivations which make, which decide how, which options the ant will choose. And in, in fact, this whole process, this whole picture is very much in keeping with not Simon, but, a, but a, a much deeper kind of model of how to work with the world, which goes way, way back, which is that by dividing the world up into its component pieces and looking at their relationships, I can build an adequate model of the world that will allow me to understand what's going on. It's a very Cartesian kind of idea. And, and it, is, it is, in fact, I think, really well grounded in Western thought uh, about how systems work. What's interesting, though, is if you think about the timing of this, they've had TMI. Actually, by now they've had Chernobyl, although that the paper was written before Chernobyl. But by, they've had TMI, they've had Chernobyl. They've got, they're faced with a real problem. The real problem is driving this. This is not thinking because we like to think about things. This is thinking because we just lost a multi-billion dollar plant. It's going to cost us $20 billion to clean it up. And the entire nuclear industry is on life support right now. And we have to figure out how to deal with this. So there's lots and lots of people who are working on this. And these guys are saying, oh, wait, we just remember that we're trying to really figure out how to help people do these kinds of functions. Just a little while after this, not uh, actually um, more than a couple of years after this paper comes out, we have an event that I think is really remarkable. It doesn't get a lot of coverage because it's happened in Canada, which as everyone knows is just another US state that hasn't yet figured it out. <laughs> um, but it turns out that in March of 1989, 10 years to the month after TMI, exactly one decade later, we have the crash of Dryden Air, Ontario. At Dryden of Air Ontario, a Fokker uh, F-28, it's a two-engine jet, which crashes on takeoff because there's ice on the wings. And the, the plane kills, there are 23 people killed, including both pilots. And the uh, uh, plane is so badly burned that neither the flight data recorder nor the cockpit voice recorder are savable. There's no data. The automatic recordings of data don't exist. They're wiped out by the fire. Very unusual event. But because this plane had just taken on a load of fuel before trying to take off, it had lots of fuel on it. 
it's clear pretty quickly that, that it was that this was somehow related to ice on the wings. It turns out that the nature of the airfoil and jets is such that with this particular design, if you have even just a little bit of ice on the wing, you aren't going to be able to fly fast enough to be able to get the lift that you need to take off. And because the ice on the wing, there was ice on the wing, and they tried to take off, they never really did. This is identified as a pilot error by the captain of the flight. The first evaluation by Canadian Aviation Board says there's a clear case of pilot error. And the reason is because these things are completely related. The pilot is the person who has the responsibility for evaluating ice on the, on the surfaces of the airplane. The pilot is the one who makes the decision to take off. If you did that, if, if you took off with ice on the wings, it doesn't matter what else you say. The pilot is to blame. All right, that's just basically the way Canadian, that, that, and, and this is a, I mean, it's not just the Canadians that feel this way. A lot of people will say the, it's absolutely essential that the pilot be able to determine that the plane is airworthy before he takes off. CAB says it's a uh, pilot error. Story ends, except that a whole bunch of people are really upset with this because Air Ontario is actually a small bush uh, aviation company that has joined with a, another company, and they have both been bought by Air Canada. And interestingly enough, um, at the same time that this was happening, there was deregulation of the aviation market so that the companies could change around and change different flights and change what they were charging. At the same time that this was going on, there was, there was a cutback in the government and the amount of regulatory numbers of people that were involved in the, in the Canadian Aviation Board's supervision stuff was limited. So you had both one explosive growth of the airline industry and a decreased size of the regulatory bodies. And there was real concern that this problem had something to do with the ongoing expansion of aviation and the problems with regulation. And Canada is a parliamentary system, so there's no, there's no, um, uh, you know, separate uh, uh, legislative uh, investigative process. So they, the way that the parliamentary democracies handled this is by having a commission, and they took a former chief justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, Justice Moshansky, and they had him do a study. And the Moshansky study, which, which started out after this, is astonishing for a whole bunch of different reasons. It, it looks at hundreds of thousands of pieces of evidence. It takes testimony under oath from a whole bunch of different people. It hires a whole bunch of technical experts. It takes about two and a half years to complete the investigation, the, the, the commission to complete the investigation, that produces a four volume, actually a, a four printed volume uh, report, which is huge, it's in my office if you want to see it, uh, that, that is the most exhaustive look at an aviation crash ever. This is an incredible look. Right? And in part, the reason that it's such an incredible look is because and when, when they crashed, when they crashed, they lost the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. And there are no, there's no indication of what the pilots were saying to each other. And there's no indication of the way the plane was working. And this absence of data meant there was a kind of vacuum there uh, about what was going on. And people had all sorts of concerns and considerations. And that, together with this growth of, of stuff, led to this kind of result. You've had a chance to read the report by Bob Helmreich, um, who is, is brought in as a, an outside consultant by, um, by the um, commission itself. And he writes what is by far uh, the most cogent, most coherent, and most interesting um, evaluation of the human factors of an aviation crash that I know of. It's the most interesting because when he did this, he actually 
looked through all the different levels of the system, including the regulator, and examined all the different kinds of problems that there were, rather than just saying, why did the pilot take off? He said, why was the pilot put in the position of having to decide whether or not to take off with ice on the wings? And he comes up with a whole list of things. You've seen the list. But the interesting thing is that there are, um, you know, there's, there's at least 25 different contributing factors here that include things like lack of regulatory oversight, poor management of the uh, aircraft company, incomplete training, no having different versions of manuals based upon where you've been trained or where you were working, not having what's called a minimal equipment list, that is the, the list of things without which the plane cannot fly, allowing the plane to be dispatched and then having arguments about refueling and taking it on and bringing off fuel. I mean, just a whole bunch of stuff. The bottom line is that all of these things ended up with this poor pilot sitting here on the runway at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon with a big layer of ice on his wings and no choices left. In fact, he had been, the, the day had gone so badly, so many things had been screwed up, so much stuff wasn't working, so many things were off, were off, that the only thing that he could do was either get the plane in the air or basically call it quits for the day. If he didn't fly, everybody was going to spend the night in Dryden, Ontario. Your 50-some passengers, are going to look for hotel rooms in a town that does not have 50 hotel rooms. Everybody who's on this plane has somewhere to be. This is the beginning of the school holiday. It's like Sweden at the school holiday. Everybody's going. Okay. The other thing is that while he's sitting down here waiting to take off and the ice is accumulating, other things are happening. A Cessna is being brought in. They get delayed for this. They get delayed for a whole bunch of different reasons. And each delay adds to the risk of, of trying to take off with ice on the wings. But the longer that he waits to take off, the worse the problem is getting. There's a huge incentive for him to get the plane in the air as quickly as possible. The longer he waits down here, the worse the situation gets. And so what you have is this situation where if he, if he stays on the ground, the risk is increasing, maybe not linearly like this, and there's, a, there's a, a, some sort of limit on where we can do, and, and there's uncertainty about where these things actually are. Where are we? I'm not sure, but we know that this is continuing to increase during this time, and he or the co-pilot and him together make the decision to take off. The decision to take off was probably made quite a bit earlier. It probably wasn't made at the end of the runway. They'd already essentially went and taxied out there and got ready to go. They were, they were ready to go, and they would have taken off, I think, in, in all likelihood, irrespective of other considerations at that point, because they were trying to go. They had all these incentives to go. And in face of all these incentives to go, they were getting virtually nothing that was helping them say, no, we shouldn't go at this point. There's no organization in the company. There's no clear stuff. That everything that the pilot had tried to do had been frustrated. He was getting no support from anybody. Now, Helmreich, in his review, is extremely critical of all these points. And then concludes something that I think is uh, hard to fathom, which is because he, he looks at all these many points. You know, there's, there's, he makes this big long list of all these items. You can read it. And then he concludes that you need no more CRM. That is, after listing all these things, all the bad stuff that the airline has done, all the screwball stuff, what he concludes is that you need more crew resource management training. Now, you can ask yourself, why is it that he says more crew resource management training is necessary? Well, it's because he invented crew resource management. Right? He's the guy who developed it. And he's the guy who has this strong belief that you can get crews to work together so they can handle virtually any problem, you can make them strong. He's still back in this kind of idea about <laughs> how do we prevent pilots from making errors 
What we really do is we, 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 we actually make it so that they have the sort of, sort of uh, fortitude, the willpower, if you will, the, the necessary something or other, so that they can together decide not to take off. It's hard for me to, to square this with what, what the rest of the report is. I think he pushes CRM way too hard. He, he is still trying to find a way to escape, have the pilots escape the system. But, but the real problem with this is that the system itself was an unsafe system. And it was playing in an unsafe way. It was running in an unsafe way. And the pilots were being constantly pressured to essentially fly in unsafe conditions. And this just is one of the unsafe conditions that turned out badly. It's not like the flights the day before were all that much better. It's just that this particular combination of small things was sufficient to cause an accident. The, the solution to this problem, in my view, is not to say more training for pilots. Okay, I, I, Pilots are extensively trained. They get a lot of that stuff. These guys' training might have been deficient. There were problems because there had been a strike that had some effect between these two companies, all that sort of stuff. I don't care about any of that because in the end, you still have a situation in which you can't turn the engine off to de-ice the plane because there's no way to get the, the engine restarted afterwards. And, and frankly, that has nothing to do with the pilots. And if you put pilots in that situation and bad things happen, it's really hard for me to say we're going to train the pilots enough so that those sorts of things aren't going to happen. What's interesting about this is when you look at this kind of an event, you realize that the world is not made up out of systems that look like Three Mile Island. That the nuclear power plant model, this model that we've been using up till now, the one that started everything, the thing that got us all going, that we all acknowledge is the, the, the watershed event to make the system, to, to make us start looking seriously at the safety of these big systems. Everyone agrees this is an incredible step. But we also see that even in the case of something like a nuclear power plant, it's so complicated that we don't really know how to trace through and figure out what the operators are doing. And now we start looking at a system out here that doesn't have these properties of a nuclear power plant. It has a huge number of factors that are in flux and changing all the time, and a huge number of difficulties in that are not related to the physical construction of the plant or the thermodynamics of things, but they're related to people doing jobs in different ways, trying to get different kinds of, of goals met and trying to achieve different things. This problem up here turns out to be related mostly to labor negotiations. How does that relate to Three Mile Island? You don't see any of that there. It could never enter into the Three Mile Island question, but here all of a sudden labor negotiations and labor strife becomes a big part of this accident scenario. And what this has done is in some ways taken our nice, safe world that we had in, in, <clears throat> in March of 79, the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant world, and it's gotten us out to this world which is much, much less easy to understand, much, much more fuzzy boundaries, not the kind of mechanical reasoning that we could go through here, a lot harder to talk about whose goals and what goals. It becomes a big, big mess. The big difference between these two is really that, and, and this is, I think, well shown in Helmreich's uh, report, the big difference here is that by the time you get to March 89 and you have this accident, it's possible for everybody to understand this as a systems accident. This is a systems accident. The system failed. This was an operator error. Somewhere in this 10 years, between March of 79 and March of 89, we went from a world where operators made errors to a world where we recognize that systems have failure modes that are that include people and their actions, but it's all the people everywhere. It's the mechanics, it's the managers, it's the union representatives, it's the regulators. That kind of view of the system as the cause of the accident, that didn't exist in 1979. 
what the progress that we've made in this period of time is to go from a model of operator errors, isolated failures, you couldn't understand what's going on, you did the wrong thing, to recognizing that what we really have in this study is a systems accident. A systems accident that's created by all these things coming together and people being unable to resolve it for us at the end. And it changes the modeling problem that we had because as long as we were dealing with operator error and these control rooms and these fairly flat planets, we could talk a lot about building all these elaborate models and, and, and talking about goals and means and all that sort of stuff. That all seemed very plausible. But when we get out here and we start to look at this, it starts to fall apart. We're having a hard time figuring it out. What is the information that we should, should, we should give to the pilots? What information display do you want them to have? The ice on the wing information display? I mean, what is it that you're going to give to, to the company so that they can understand these relationships? It's really, really hard to do. If you, under, if you understand this event, this, you're, you're looking at all the factors that contribute to the pilot making this decision, but you, you really find it hard, if you read the full report or even Helmreich's view of it, you really find it hard to say, gee, if I just had a little bit more crew resource management training, I would have been able to avoid this accident. The idea of blame and train, which was so much part of this, that we blame the operators first, and we train them so that they will never do this again. This is gone here. It's not a satisfactory answer. In fact, what happens is that the Canadian uh, Aviation Board tries to advance this answer and gets shot down. They say it's a case of pilot error, end of story. They try the old blame and train thing. Doesn't fly, literally. And you get this big commission study that changes this. And this is really the onset of the, of the kind of idea of system error. Now, we're pretty close to the end of our time. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about um, the other papers here. I do want to mention just briefly uh, a couple of things in um, Hutchins' paper. Uh, Hutchins' paper and Hutchins' book are, are wonderful. If you can read Hutchins' paper and get how it is that Trobrand Islanders navigate, it's really something It's very hard to do because we are map and compass people. But you can get a feeling in there at one point that he does actually get it when he, when he says there's this point at which he realizes that if he draws the lines to the navigator where they intersect, the navigator will be able to see it. This idea that the boat is essentially stationary and the world is moving around underneath us, <coughs> and his description of that is really powerful. But the real warning in this is something else, and what's one of the things that we have to be very careful of. And <coughs> It's one of the things that I think is the most dangerous for this particular group. And that's the reason that the paper is in here. Because all of you, virtually all of you, are practitioners, but you're all planning to do your studies of cognitive tasks and cognitive work in your home domains. And, and Hutchins says something very interesting here. He says, there's a real methodological bind here due to the fact that we as researchers use our culture's notion of motion both to navigate ourselves and to understand how others navigate. The enterprise is clearly fraught with opportunities to misinterpret observations and bias descriptions. This is a warning that you should take and put out in bold type, print it out, and put it above your bed at night, because this is the real danger. For you who want, to, if you go to a foreign topic, a foreign area, a foreign domain, where you are not an expert, the chances that you're going to get it wrong are much less because you're going to actually have to find out how the operators view the system. But when you go to the world that you already know and you try to study it, you have in your head a model of how that world works. And as a consequence, it's very easy for you to sort of slip your model in to what you think the operator's model is. What Hutchins tells us here is that there are are something on the order of 80 or 90 years of study of the navigations of these people that get it wrong all the time. Because people are unable to escape their own models of navigation and actually take on the position of a Micronesian navigator. And in doing cognitive work studies, one of the crucial elements is to be able to do that switch. 
to put yourself essentially in the position of the person who is trying to confront those problems so that you can understand what those cognitive tasks really are. And he points out here that this is actually a very difficult task. It's much harder than people expect. And he says, as is the case with any truly expert performance in any culture, the experts themselves are often unable to specify just what it is they do when they are, while they are performing. Doing the task and explaining what one is doing required quite different ways of thinking. And this is especially true for us in medicine, and it's one of the major problems with healthcare studies. Docs, nurses, pharmacists are all are just great talkers. They're facile, they're sophisticated, they've got great vocabularies, and so they yakety yak. And they will, if you ask them why they're doing something, they will give you an explanation for it. That explanation is usually completely unrelated to the actual why, the cognitive functions of what they are doing when they're trying to solve that problem. So Hutchins is giving us a pretty big warning here. And it's something that you ought to take to, to heart because you're choosing to do your studies in a way that is actually the most difficult way, which is to stay in an area where you already have a great deal of domain knowledge. It's not impossible, but it is much more hazardous because it's very easy to imagine that you understand the cognition of the people that you are studying because it seems natural to you that things should be done that way. And it is only by doing this kind of research in an almost anthropologic way that Hutchins is able to actually uncover this and figure out what's going on. So with that warning, we sort of come to the end of this first phase of how is it that we're going to look at operators and understand what the, what's going on. We, we, we saw on Three Mile Island and in Rasmussen that there was a kind of methodological way that we could do this. We looked at Woods and Holmengel and we say, oh yes, they're on to something. This is clearly what we want to do. It's very complicated though. And at the end we realized, ooh, it's actually maybe so complicated that it may not actually be practical in most situations. We can look at some, but building whole models of systems is hard. And then we kind of blew up the system by going from 1979 to 1989 and saying, oh, here's this really complicated system. They said this was a complex system. Now let me show you a really complex system. This one over here, now that's complex. And if you step from here into uh, 2009 or 2013 and you say, look at medicine, you realize that the complexity here is very likely to overwhelm us as we try to look at different kinds of operations. This is a real risk. It's a real problem with doing what we do. And it's one of the reasons that people get defeated or feel like they're defeated as they try to do these things. Because the complexity of this tends to overwhelm us. The next session that we do is going to talk about how ought we to pursue this? What, how, how can we get into this world? It's clear that people are doing these things. It's really clear that we need to understand what's happening in the operator's mindset, we have to get into that to know what's going on. But it's unclear exactly how to do it. That formal mechanism that Woods and Holmakel seem to suggest, we don't think that's got much <coughs> so we need to do something else now. And that's what we'll be pursuing in the next uh, in the next seminar the next year. Okay? Who has questions? I have time to fair fair foot so that I can do your time without any kind of questions. Questions? 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 Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm probably slow, but I, I still see parallels in the, this paper from Woods and Holmegel and, and uh, the second case with the drive-in and, and the approach to uh, looking at systems by sort of mapping out the terrain and, and also looking at the drives between, behind actions. I just I see they they range the system in different ways. You need a wider range, perhaps, there. But I mean, you can't look into into people's heads. So that's again going back to that analogy. You try to find out what the beach is and what the ants' motivations are. That's a way of of seeing possible system states. There's nothing wrong with what Woods and Holmegel are saying. I'm not, and I didn't mean to suggest that they've said it incorrectly. I didn't mean to say that, that they're wrong in, in any kind of formal way. I mean to say that the complexity of the real world 
overwhelms our best intentions to make these clear and, and exhaustive kinds of models. And although we end up trying to figure out a way to, that will make things better for operators, we really end up kind of looking back at the operators. Even, even Woods and Holney will admit that although we're trying to model the demands the, the domain puts on the operators, the information that we're going to try and get is by, by looking at the operators and trying to figure out what they are doing again. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's not a complete modeling process that gets us someplace. I don't think that they're wrong in a theoretical sense. I think they're wrong in a practical sense. Because I think, in fact, that you can't do it. Every time people have tried to do it, they get either overwhelmed by the number of, of things that are there and they can't, they essentially run out of stuff. They can't go any further and they don't know what they've got. Or they end up picking a particular area and working through it, but recognizing that they've only got some small subset of the system. And I think that if this is the tra this is the, the trade-off that you're going to end up trying to make as you try to study these areas, which is, I want to get a big enough picture that I've explained what's important in the system. But in order to do to make it manageable and to do the right sorts of things, I have to somehow bomb bound what it is that I'm looking at in a way that lets me understand this particular area. I've got to figure out how to look. What should I be do spending my time on? Because otherwise, I'm going to spend years and years and years building models of things that are changing so fast that in fact the model that I've produced will be out of date by the time I've written it down. So I, 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 I think you're right that, that, that there's a strong connection here. And, and I think it's clear that Woods and Holnagel, because they were still working on trying to figure out the nuclear power plant problem, have, have tried very hard to set up a path by which you could get to good results there. But in the meantime, we start having accidents in other places and other types of things that are pulling us forward into a future that looks quite different. And indeed, if you look at Chernobyl, you're going to suddenly realize that, that a lot of this stuff is going to become out of out of our reach, that we're never going to be able to get into this. We're never going to be able to touch on it. Chernobyl in 1986, and by 1989, starts safety culture. Safety culture is, a, is directly the product of Chernobyl. The words first used there, it's first described uh, in relationship to Chernobyl. All the safety culture stuff comes out of Chernobyl. And, and the reason that people talk about safety culture is they just can't figure out how the heck those guys can get into a situation where they it just seems inconceivable that these guys could be could be trying to operate that reactor that way. It's a it's a Chernobyl is a complete revolution in the way that people start to look at these things. Here you have these reasonable operators trying to work on a plant that had, had a fault in it that was broken and trying to fix it. In Chernobyl, you have people trying to do an experiment with a reactor running it in very unusual conditions that they actually do not truly understand. And because of the design of the reactor, end up producing a runaway reaction. They get, a, they get essentially a positive reactivity coefficient and nothing blows up. And everybody afterwards is trying to figure out why the system could be, could be left this way. The plans in the, the people who developed the reactor, they understood that this was a possibility. They understood that it was a hazard. They were busy trying to get people to change the reactor so that it wouldn't have this particular kind of problem. Just didn't get there in time. So we're going to, from, from Three Mile Island, what's going to happen is we're going to have this expansion outwards in all these different directions. Cockpit resource, or crew resource management, uh, different kinds of safety culture, all this stuff is going to start exploding out here as people encounter new accidents and try, and try and cope with the results of them. One of the things that you're going to find, though, is that most of the steps of improvement, most of the activities that go on are, are accident-driven. That is, each one of these things is a kind of increment that gets we get pulled forward by the next accident that we have. The next accident is what shapes the way we do things and causes us to build new models and turn our, our attention in new directions. It's all accident driven. Although we wish it were not, although we all want to go into the world of cognitive systems engineering where everybody thinks these things through from the beginning and builds nice systems, in the end, it's all about the accidents. 